Yeah, Hebrews 9 is a, a wonderful chapter, and uh, the sermon I've got today, um, I'm hoping it's edifying for everyone here. It's, uh, it's called Purchased, but Not Redeemed. So there's a couple of ways to look at this. One of them is that the whole world was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, but not being, not being mixed with faith, that doesn't do them any good. So they haven't actually redeemed. Um, pastor actually gave me this example. He said, you know, it's like God's given you a coupon for eternal life and you have to actually redeem that. If you choose not to redeem that, then you don't receive eternal life. So, but it's already paid for, it's already done. Um, so that's one way you can look at that. But also the, way, the one I'm looking at today uh, is actually just for us. It's for believers, people who have already put all their faith and trust on Jesus Christ. It's helping us to understand how we're purchased, but we're actually not redeemed in full yet. So what happened when I believed on Jesus Christ, um, when I asked him to save me, is the transaction that took place. In that moment, I gave him all of my sin, past, present, and future, and he gave me his righteousness. And he left the Holy Spirit with me as well to guide, comfort, and conform me to his image. And that's a very good deal for me, but he actually paid a very steep price for that. And it's not a fair deal for him, it's actually very one-sided in my favour. But he did that for all of us, even the whole world, because he loves us and he wants us to be like him. So there are three main points I'll be covering today. So there's, of course, the purchase. There's the redemption of our spirit, which you receive the moment you believe on Christ. And finally, there's our future redemption of our bodies, which we receive at the coming of the Lord. So, and we see them all throughout scripture as well. You'll see those three things. Uh, and it's important that we understand this truth. It actually makes it easier to live on this earth, understanding this truth. Um, but it also helps you to understand how God's going to redeem us and how we can live in expectation of that redemption. So when Jesus died for us, he redeemed our spirit. It says he, he was quickened and made alive. He purchased our body that we would be his children and do works for him, which he rewards. But he's not yet redeemed our body and we don't receive that until the resurrection of the saints. And that happens when, uh, when the Lord returns in the sky at the rapture. See, we're purchased under sanctification to be set apart and conformed to his image, to live for him. But we still have a choice while we're on this earth. We need to make the right one. And that's to walk in the ways that he set before us. So if you want to turn to Colossians chapter 1, I'll read to you from Isaiah chapter 52 verse 3. It says, For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now, what a beautiful promise that is. When the Lord redeemed us, we were redeemed not by money, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll see in a second. In Psalm 49, verse 6, it says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth, ceaseth forever that he should live, still live forever and not see corruption. See, nobody can offer eternal life but the Lord God himself. It's only by faith in him and it cannot be purchased with money or good works. But he, through his blood, he purchased us to be children of God, to have eternal life and to serve him through our bodies. So you're there in Colossians chapter 1. Just look at verse 12. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See, this, as Brother Jason preached this morning, it's like that's one of the great promises of God. He's forgiven us of all our sins. That's one of the blessings that we get from God. So when we believe on his Son we receive that blessing, all the forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future, and we don't get what we deserve in this life, as far as chastisement goes. Uh, and verse, uh, verse 20, just go down. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet hath Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. 
So, of course, Jesus has preeminence because he's the firstborn, he's the first resurrected, he's the first begotten of the Father. And he reigns over the church, being the head in all things, because he died for the church, he paid for it. But he also died for us and paid for us with his blood. And he's the God, the creator of all things from the beginning. He reconciled us to the Father. He removed our sins and imputed his righteousness. Again, that's one of those great blessings of God that nobody could give you that but God himself. Uh, If you want to turn to Titus chapter 2, I'll read to you from Acts 13. It says, And we declare unto you glad tidings. That's glad tidings is another way. The gospel is is another type of uh, glad tidings. They're used interchangeably. It says, How that promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it's also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So when Jesus was begotten, that's talking about his resurrection, when he received his new body. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I'll give you the sure mercies of David. See, Jesus was the first to be resurrected and to receive his reward, and that's why he's called the first begotten. But we'll also be begotten in the same way as we receive our new bodies that is coming. So it says we'll never see corruption in that body and we'll receive our rewards at that time as well. So you're in Titus chapter 2, look at verse 13. It says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. So that's point one, how we're purchased in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we'll move on to point two now, and that is that our soul is redeemed, our person has been purchased by the completion of the, but the redemption is not yet. So the redemption of our spirit by faith alone is not of works and not purchasable with money. But we still have this body of sin, the flesh that cannot be brought under subjection to the law. So if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll read to you from John chapter 3. And we're all familiar with this passage, but John chapter 3 verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, You must be born again. So this is again talking about that spiritual quickening, that our spirit being made alive where it was once dead. And it comforts us to ensure us that we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This body will not inherit anything, but the redeemed body will receive the inheritance. And we're not alone on this earth as we live out our days because we have the comforter, the Holy Ghost, that the Lord has left with us. He's with us at all times. So you're there in 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 22. It says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto one fain love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So we're born a new creature. We're born not of the flesh, but we're born of God and God's word. And we're able to do what's right and serve him because we have that new, ma- that new man inside of us. But we also still have that old flesh. That old man, he's capable of all manner of wickedness. So if we choose not to walk in the righteousness of the new man then we can commit all manner of sin. And that flesh is doomed to die, so it will wither and fall away as the grass. But it is a tool to be used so we can earn rewards in heaven. 
So we still need that body. Um, and God needs that body because God's not coming down to do the work himself. He's left us here to do the work for him. So he needs our body. That's why he purchased our body. So if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, I'll just read from 1 Peter 3.18. It says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. In Ephesians 2 verse 1 it says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedient, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So we, before we were saved, we were just like these children of disobedience. You know, Satan would just have his way with us and we'd be tempted in all things and we'd do all things because we had no, no way to judge righteously. But it continues on, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So again, all our sins have been forgiven. All those things we did when we were children of disobedience, the Lord had mercy on us. And when we heard the gospel and believed it, then he showed us that mercy. And he quickened us together with Christ and raised us up to sit in heavenly places. Like that's why we're kings and priests you know, after the order of Melchizedek, because that's what Christ is. So we're also kings and priests with him, ruling and reigning with him, because he's given that to us, you know, and that's his authority to give. But we're born again, quickened in the spirit. That means our spirit was dead, but it's made alive in Christ. And that's that new man that's born of God, that's born of the word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35 says, But some men will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat, or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. See, our spirit was dead through sin, but that's why it could be quickened, because it was dead. It was made alive again by the Spirit of God. And until this body dies or is changed on that day, it cannot be quickened. So, and the body spoken of here is the body that God has prepared for us. You know, the moment uh, we get saved, we receive the promise, the inheritance of that, which is the Holy Ghost, but we don't receive that body until His coming. So, yeah, and he's quickened our spirits so that while we're on this earth and while even we have this, this flesh, we can still do good works for God and we can still do the work that he's set aside for us. And we'll see that in just a second. So, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, so it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. So again, if we had a perfect body, we would get the glory. But God wants the glory. So he uses even this imperfect body, this imperfect flesh, so that he will receive the glory. In verse number 10, it says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now, how do we do that? Like in this, in this uh, context here, they're talking about how the apostles were also... All you know, put to death, or many of them were put to death, fearing for their lives because, you know, they were going to follow after Christ. But even for us, through the gospel and through the way we live and everything else, we can show the righteousness of Christ through us, through these bodies. So there's, there's many ways you can do that. In Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So again, salvation, it's not a works, but it was purchased by the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. But verse 10, For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus on two good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So that's the thing. The Lord rewards his people who are doers. If you want to turn to Psalm 31. See, the Lord rewards us for all the works we do, but as his children being born again of the Spirit, we are made to work for him. See, he has ordained certain works for us to do, and we should work out our faith with fear and trembling, doing those works that are set before us. But we do have, again, a choice. We have free will. We can be obedient, do those works, or we can be disobedient and not do those works. And that is a daily struggle. Even the Apostle Paul talks about that. But we know the Lord gives us liberty to choose. And of course, there are rewards or chastisement associated with either doing his will or choosing not to. And that's the things we do in this body, in this sinful flesh. Draw there in Psalm 31. Look at verse 14. It says, But I trusted in thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my God. My times are in my hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sakes. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed and let them be silent in the grave. Let, this lying, let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which is laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. So again, here's some of those blessings and rewards you can receive on this earth, is the Lord can quieten your enemies. And when they come and attack the righteous, the Lord can shut them down. Look at verse 20, though. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvellous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. O love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all that hope in the Lord. So again, Lord plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. But of course, if you do nothing for the Lord, then you're not going to be getting rewards, not on this earth and not in heaven. But that's those who are obedient to the works he set before us. And my works are not your works. The Lord has works for everyone. Now, of course, you know, preaching the gospel is a commandment for everyone. But there are also other works that for some people they're set aside for them and for other people that's not what God has for them. Like not everyone's going to be a pastor, not everyone should be a deacon, not everyone can lead the song leading, not everyone can play the piano. But if you can, then that's the way that God's got for you to serve the Lord. And he wants you to use your skills, the skills he's given you to serve him. Uh, If you want to turn to first, uh, actually turn to Romans chapter 7. And we'll look at verse 14. And this is Paul talking about uh, the struggle that he has daily with his flesh. In Romans 7, 14, it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for that I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So he's saying that the flesh only ever wants to sin. He knows the right thing to do, but the body, the flesh, is fighting against him to do that. And he does the things he doesn't want to do, because the flesh is leading him to do those wicked things. But the, in his mind, you know, through, in his spirit, he's rebelling against his body, against those things. But this is the battle that happens daily. Because the new man can only do good. He's of the righteousness of Christ. But the old man, he can do all manner of wicked. And we need to choose every day which way we're going to go. But the Bible teaches that even though the body is wicked... It's incapable of conforming to God's laws that we still have to fight that daily. You know, ourselves must die daily to walk in the Spirit, to do the things we know are right in the eyes of the Lord. 
But we should understand that because of this flesh, because of this body of death, we'll continue to, we'll, we'll continue to sin till the day that it dies. Or if you're fortunate enough to be caught up in the air with the Lord on that day, then it will be changed. But even then, with our mind and with our spirit, we can still serve the law of God and of Christ. As Paul continues, he says, For the good that I would, I do not. So in verse 19. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the Lord of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, his members talking about his body, his flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. It's only in the new man we can achieve walking in righteousness. So we need to kill the old man has to die every day. We need to kill him every day and walk in the new man so that we can walk in righteousness. And that's why commands such as the ones in, in 1 John, which some people do struggle with, but in 1 John 2.15 it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now this flesh, it loves the world, but the love of the Father is not in this flesh. The love of the Father is in the spirit, in the mind, in the new man. It says, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So again, this flesh is going to pass away. This whole world's going to pass away. All sin will pass away, but the new man, he will abide forever because he's born of God, and he always doeth the will of the Father. And that's our battle. We need to forsake the things of this world and to set our th sights on things above, on that heavenly Jerusalem. You know, the heavenly rewards that we'll get instead of worrying about, uh, you know, this earth. We need to do the will of God on this earth. Because as I said before, God's not coming down to do it himself. He's relying on us to get it done. And when he does return, it's going to be a day of resurrection for us but as a day of wrath on the ungodly. And he set us up to work his works until that day. So I'll read from Colossians chapter 3. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear... Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. See, and that's, that's talking present tense. We are risen with Christ. Ye are dead. Our old man's dead. This flesh is already dead. We can't walk in this flesh. We need to not walk in this flesh. We need to walk in the new man because we are risen in Christ. We are a new creature. And we should set our affection on those heavenly things. Earning rewards, you know, for, for gold, silver, precious stones. And sometimes... You do need to do wood, hay and stubble just to get by in this world, but we should be concentrating on those gold, silver, precious stones, those spiritual things, the things that will earn us rewards. So in, in Colossians 3.5, it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. That's die daily. Put off, put off the flesh and walk in the spirit. And, uh, and what are those things? It says fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For the which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. See, and it says we used to walk in them. But what shall we do? It says put on therefore as the elect of God in verse 12. Uh, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. These are the things of the Spirit. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in the name of the Lord, in, in your hearts the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. 
So this is a conscious effort we have to make every day, is to put off the old man and the wickedness that comes with it, the sin, and put on the new man and his righteousness, which is the imputed righteousness of Christ. But it explains to us here how we do that too, through reading the scriptures, through singing psalms and hymns to the Lord, praying and even asking the Lord to fill you with the Spirit. You know, the new man is always there, but so is the old man. And we have to decide daily and even hourly how we're going to walk. It's easier said than done. It's easy to get up here and say this is what we have to do, but we all know how hard that is. It's a real struggle every single day. But it says, magnify Christ in your body, which he had purchased with his own blood. So again, we need to also have unity in the spirit because we have that same earnest of the inheritance. So as, as much as I know that I'm going to receive a new body on that day, I know that you also are carrying around your sinful flesh, but you will have that, that redeemed body as well in the same time I will. But we're all, we've all got the same struggles. It's why we need to be careful not to judge each other too harshly about, you know, if your brother's struggling with something, we all know that we all have struggles. We all have our sins and we all, you know, so we need to have mercy on, on our brethren as well, understanding that the Lord has mercy on us. But in Philippians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So to live is Christ. This is the works and rewards we can do for the Lord. But to die is gain because we also know that at that time we'd just be immediately with the Lord forever. So we don't have a downside. We can either spend our time on this earth working for the Lord and when we die we go to be with him. But even if we're taken early, we still get to be with the Lord. There's no, you know. And Paul, the Apostle Paul knew that as well. He said, look, whether I live or die, I'm going to magnify Christ in my body either way, whether it's through life or death. <coughs> Verse 22 but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose or what not? For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for all your furtherance and joy of faith. And verse 29, For unto you it's given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So again, he's talking about that constant struggle. It's even a life of suffering, knowing we have this wicked flesh conflicting with the pure spirit of God. It's righteousness versus unrighteousness. And you can't fix this flesh. As long as you're alive on this earth, you cannot fix this flesh. It'll always be there and it won't end. But what our hope is, where our faith is, is in that new resurrected body which is incapable of sin because it's born of God. That's where we set our hope. That's where we set our eyes. And that's why we put off this flesh daily to walk in the new man and keep busy doing God's work. So our hope is that this battle of the flesh, it will end one day. You know, it'll, it'll end on the day of the Lord, but it can also end earlier if you die and go to heaven before that day. But at least on that day we know that it's, it's going to end. This suffering on this earth will end. And we know it to be true. Just as certain as we know the Lord was re resurrected, we know that we will be resurrected. So in Titus 2 verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, 
zealous of good works. So again, our blessed hope in context, that's what our hope is for the redemption in full of the purchased possession, being conformed to the image of his son. And it's something that's not easy, that, but that's something that the spirit will work on within you. Because Christ wants to inherit brethren who are like him, um, which is why he's given us the spirit to, to help us to walk in righteousness, because it's only by his righteousness that we can even do that. But we will be perfected in that day, will be completed. It's not possible in this life, but our new man will have a body like the Lord's resurrected body. And that's our inheritance, that's our redemption. That's what we have to look forward to. And Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. See, we can have a taste of that divine nature through the quickened spirit, through the new man. But to understand this true nature, we, don't, we won't fully understand that until the completed inheritance, until we receive that new body that's also born of God. In 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that man that hath hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So he's saying, look, we don't know what that's going to look like yet. We don't fully understand what, the, what it means to partake of that divine nature. You know, as in, it, we're not going to be gods. We're not God. God is still God. But we can partake of his divine nature through that body which is born of God. Because there are elements, you know, of godliness in that body, in, in the fact that we will not sin, in the fact that, you know, this is the same body that Christ received, but we just need to understand that we're not gods. You know, there's still, we're not deity, there's separation there. But in the, in the way that he received that body is how we receive that body. It's like a picture, an example of how, how we shall appear because he's prepared a body for us. And he wants people that are in his image, you know, without sin, obviously. It's, there's going to be a difference, but we don't understand exactly what that's going to look like. Um, but I'll, I'll move on to point three now, which is the inheritance. So this is what we have to look forward to, and this is where we hold our hope. See, it's the new heaven and the new earth, and it says the redeemed shall walk there. There's, of course, the millennial reign with Christ, but of course, there's also the new heaven and new earth. But we don't receive that um, until our new bodies are fully redeemed. And the old flesh can't inherit the kingdom of God at all, but we receive a body which will. Um, reading from Job chapter 19, 25. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. See, Job knew, and Job is, you know, I mean, you're talking going back probably 4,000 years for Job. I, I don't know exactly, but he knew that he would stand in the latter day, but not in this flesh. He knew this flesh wouldn't see God, because this flesh can't look upon God and live. There's too much sin in this flesh. But he knows that in, in a fleshly body, he will stand before the Lord and see him with his own eyes. And we know that same promise too for us. We're going to stand before God and we'll see him with our own eyes in this new redeemed body. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to the abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this is where we, we set the hope. You know, I preached on hope a little while ago, but it's an expectation and knowing that it will come to pass. And I have complete confidence in that. I know I'm going to receive a new body at the coming of the Lord after the tribulation, the great tribulation and the Antichrist is revealed is when the Lord will come back. That's when we'll see the Lord and our hope and expectation is receiving our inheritance on that day. 
So if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 35, and after that we'll be in Revelation 22. But Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1, it says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice. The blossom is the rose. It shall blossom abundantly, and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. And, you know, even out of context, I like taking this that, you know, we can have confidence the Lord's going to return. We know he's coming with vengeance as well as with reward. And I have no doubt about that. Uh, verse 35 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap out as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, which each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, through, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And you'll see parallels there with like Revelation, I think, 21 and 22, where it talks about how God wipes away all our tears and how, you know, of course, the redeemed will walk there. And I believe that some of this is speaking of the new, new heaven and new earth or the heavenly Zion, the city of God, which does come down. And perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. Um, but that is going to be our life of inheritance. You know, it's a beautiful picture of how we'll all dwell together in perfect bodies and spirits in that promised land, a land without sin, a land without death, and a land where the Lord is God of all. So in Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, and bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there should be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. See, I believe this is exactly what Job was speaking of when he says he'll see the face of God, but he'll do it in his new flesh. You'll see it in his flesh, but he said, but this body's going to die. So Job understood this. I mean, how, long, how much later was Revelation penned down? <laughs> and yet, you know, obviously the Bible's consistent because the Bible's the word of God. But, you know, again, Job's speaking of a very future event where he knows he'll stand before God, he'll see him face to face. And we see our eternity with the Father receiving a new name, seeing him face to face is for us as well. It's for all the saints, all the believers. But it's only possible with that redeemed spirit and the redeemed body. So until then, we are stuck with our flesh. But the, the new body is not flesh and blood, it's flesh and bone. Um, which Christ, when Christ returns, he says, look, you know, he says, uh, I think I thought he was a ghost. He says, look, you know, I got flesh and bone. I can eat, touch me, you know. And Thomas even stuck his, uh, stuck his hand in, in the hole in his side, you know, so he could actually touch him and he could eat. He ate fish and, you know, said, I've got flesh and bone. That was a resurrected body that Christ received. So we know we'll have a similar body. Uh, we don't know a lot about it, but we know that much. But we know that we can't receive um, any of the inheritance in this flesh. This flesh cannot inherit anything, but the new body will inherit all things when we're redeemed in full. And knowing that, we also know we can endure suffering in this flesh because we know this flesh, the end of this flesh is to die anyway. You know, we know that 
This flesh is not worth saving. We've got a new body coming. So we can work in this flesh. We can run it into the ground. You know, just work, work, work. As some, you know, some of the saints, it says that they work so hard, they're almost unto death. Like, that's not something we should do. But, you know, obviously he was looking on the heavenly things. And so to provide the needs of Paul, he worked himself almost to death. And, you know, he said, he's like, I'd rather do that because his body's meant for the grave anyway. <laughs> but uh, we know that even if they're going to threaten this body, if they want to take and destroy us, if they want to kill us, God says, don't fear them which can destroy the body, but fear him which call, can destroy both soul and body in hell. He said, look, they can destroy this body, but what is, what is that going to solve? You're going to wake up in heaven. As I said, there's, no, there's nothing for us to lose. And the, the apostles even counted themselves worthy to suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So we should also, you know, if we're counted worthy to suffer in this body for the cause of Christ, then we should rejoice in that too. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, it says, Now I say, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we have victory over death, which is why we don't fear death, because Christ has given us the victory over death. And we know that flesh and blood, this, this body of corruption, cannot enter the kingdom of God. It can't inherit anything. So we must first put on perfection and immortality. And those bodies, of course, will be immortal. They will never die. And they will be perfect. They will never sin. But they're not flesh and blood as these bodies of corruption. So Revelation 21, verse 1. This, of course, speaks of our, uh, again, another part of our inheritance, the new heaven and new earth. It says, For the first heaven and the first earth, were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be, there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Again, that's the earth, all this flesh, everything's all passed away by this point. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That's the new heaven and new earth. And he said unto me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain the water of life freely. He that overcometh, shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, abominable murderers, whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, the only reason anyone who does those sins, or any sins at all, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, it's because no flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of God. No sin can enter the kingdom. So what the Lord means by that is that those who are of faith, those who have their sins forgiven and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, they will receive that new body which will inherit all things. And that is a body not of flesh and blood, but it's flesh and bone, it's born of God. It cannot sin because it's incorruptible and it's put on immortality. And that's who's going to inherit the kingdom. See, that's who will enter the gates of New Jerusalem. And that's who will be with the Lord forever and ever. He is 100% born of God and there's no iniquity in him. See, Jesus lived that perfect and sinless life with no iniquity in him. 
And that's what's imputed to us through the Spirit and the new resurrected body. So in Philippian, Philippians 2 verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So again, it's talking about the Lord's sacrifice, his atonement. This is, the, this is the purchasing of all of his, what would become brethren of the Lord and children of God. We're in verse 9. This is where the Lord receives his reward. It says, Wherefore God also hath, also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And we can use the Lord as an example of this. See, Jesus suffered on this earth. He suffered more than anyone's ever suffered on this earth, as well as going to hell for three days and three nights. But when he obeyed the Father in all things, he received his award, his reward. You know, he sacrificed himself, even unto death, despising the shame, took upon the curse for us, but he received his reward in that new resurrected body, showing us how we can also receive our reward in the same manner when we receive our resurrected bodies. See, he's exalted above all things except for the Father himself. And he sits on the right hand, ruling and reigning. And he says, we will also rule and reign with him. Again, that's, that's going to be our reward because he's bringing his reward, our reward with him because he's being given the reward over all things. He gets a millennial reign as well, but he allows us to reign with him for also because we've believed in him. We receive that reward as well, but we receive that in those new bodies. But these bodies of death and sin, there'll be no reigning in that. You know, they're either going to be dead in the ground or they're going to be changed on the day the Lord returns if you're alive at that time. And that's why, again, we know any sufferings for a short time and we are called to partake of the sufferings of Christ. So, even those who are saints in heaven now, they haven't received their full inheritance either. So the dead in Christ rise first, then they which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will be changed. But they're also going to inherit the fullness of the promise at the same time we do. So King David will get his body the same day I get mine. The, you know, all the Old Testament saints. And that's why men like Job understood that. So we're almost, we're almost done now. In Isaiah 62, um, verse 6, it says, I've set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night, yet that make mention of the Lord. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, and give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine, for the which thou hast laboured. But they that have gathered it shall eat it, and praise the Lord, and they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out of the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So again, proclaim the word of the Lord, which is something we do, obviously, through preaching and of preaching the gospel out door to door. But we're waiting for that great and terrible day of the Lord, where our enemies are trampled and the righteous are rewarded, by the Lord himself. But I just love the wording here, where it says, And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. And I believe during the millennium, obviously, there's going to be people, you know, who are saved during that time. There'll be people outside. And that is the city that they are going to seek out, the city not forsaken, because we're going to be there. All the righteous of God, the holy people of God, 
the redeemed of the Lord will be there. And what a, what a time that's going to be. So in Revelation 22, verse 10, it says, And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that's righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the, ci- into the city. So again, if you have believed on the Lord, then all of this inheritance is yours. See, doing the will of the Father, that's by believing on Jesus Christ the Saviour. In, uh, in John chapter 6, so in John chapter 6, verse 29, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. That's, of course, Jesus Christ. And verse 39 and 40, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all that he hath given me I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus Christ said, look, I'm going to raise you up on the last day. So what more do you need than that? That fills me with all manner of confidence to know that my Lord is coming back for me to give me reward and to give me a new body. And one day I'll walk with him in the new millennium as well as in the new heaven and new earth. But it shows our redemption's only in part but it will be in full at the rapture, the day of the Lord. We're still stuck in this flesh. It can't be brought under subjection to the law. It's contrary to all things that are good. But walking in the Spirit is how we can do good in this world. And we will be, we will be rewarded for the works we do on this earth. There's no question about that. For the things we do in this body, even though it's corrupt, that's why we're still here. Because God has works for us but we won't enjoy those heavenly rewards in this body. We receive them in the new perfected body like Jesus Christ received his reward after his resurrection. That's why it calls him the first begotten. Because we'll also be begotten of the Father in that same day. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since it was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So again, they that turn many to righteousness, they'll, bro- they'll shine very brightly. You know, those who haven't done any works for the Lord, they'll probably be quite dim. But this is speaking, of course, you know, of even our resurrection in that day. But what's the point of the sermon? It's to remind us that we're purchased by the blood of Christ, that we have received the earnest of our inheritance. That's the Holy Ghost. It's a sign of our redemption until the completion of that transaction, of the purchased possession, which is our bodily resurrection. And we should continue in good works as the Lord has prepared for us, looking forward to that hope of resurrection and the new heavenly Jerusalem, because that's the promised land that will dwell forever with the Lord. Revelation twenty one twenty seven says, and there, shall be no, and there shall in no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, then your name will never be blotted out of that book, that Lamb's book of life. In Revelation 3, 5, it says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And Revelation 21, 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So again, just through these verses, we can see, you know, 
we will, he that overcometh, who is he that overcometh? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he that overcometh, the same will inherit all things. And these are promises for us who are of faith in Jesus Christ, who have believed and received the earnest of that inheritance, but have not received the inheritance. So while it gets difficult here in the flesh, we battle daily. We're suffering because of sin. We've got disease and all manner of things that that run through these bodies of death, of corruption. We have hope one day it will all be over and we will receive rewards that the Lord deems worthy. And we know the the Lord (laughs) will give us more than probably we deserve in that day. He'll reward us, though, for the works we've done. (coughs) We know that it's going to be worth it, all the suffering on this earth, but we should also remember that we have an advocate with the Father when we do sin, who's Jesus Christ the righteous. So when we do sin, we confess and forsake our sins and receive forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So because we have this body of sin, we need to do this daily. We also need to put off the old man and walk in the new man. But we can take comfort in knowing what our inheritance is. So let's pray.